could you tell me about a few of the major operations you participated in? Well, it was mostly patrolling. All of Italy, okay. we covered Italy, Greece, Turkey, North Africa, Casablanca, Algiers. We would just cover all these places, part of the Sixth Fleet. And you were patrolling to protect against uh, submarines? Uh, no, at that time the war was over. We were sort of, uh, it was more like goodwill and the, the biggest threat at that time was communism. And Russia was yeah. already giving us a bad time. And dur uh, during the war you did lots of patrolling as well? Yeah, we, we did one uh, convoy guarding a convoy that was going from America to Europe. While you were not on the convoy, uh, what were you doing most of the time? Uh, well, it, uh, then after the convoy, we were sent to the Sixth Fleet in the Mediterranean. The Navy has different fleets. The Asian Fleet is the Seventh Fleet. The Mediterranean Fleet was the Sixth Fleet. And we covered all the Mediterranean, Spain, France, Italy, Greece, Turkey, North Africa. Uh, so we had a bigger range that we covered. What was the camaraderie like? Oh, well, we only had 13 officers on my ship, so very tight. Uh, we had 400 men on the ship, uh, mostly on honors. The, 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 the story was they called the James C. Ords, O W E N S. Uh, we had 400 sailors and we had 13 officers. So it's been a very close group of people. And uh, I assume you had lots of free time while you were sailing. Uh, it was so, you know, as a young officer, meeting, meeting people. We, we attended a lot of parties. But you know, when we got to France, when the war was over, it was, like if there was a party in Villefranche, they were, were just near Monte Carlo. There were so many French young men that had died. There was, was a shortage of men for these parties. So they would send out of the ship, they'd send a messenger. Could you give us two officers tonight for this party to, as escorts? So we had a lot of that. And what was the hardest moment of the war for you? The hardest moment? Don't forget the war was over. But, but even though the war was over, there were accidents. Like the, uh, the USS Fox was in Venice. They were supposed to come to Trieste, to Trieste to relieve us so we could go back home. There were still mines floating around the Adriatic and the, the fox coming to relieve us in the Adriatic coming up to Trieste, they, they, they went through a minefield. Were, the mines were sunk. This one broke loose, hit the rear of the ship blew up the rear of the ship, the, the sailors who were sleeping in the rear of the ship, they got blown against the ceiling and killed eight men and wounded about 13 and then bombed and immobilized the ship. We had a squad of tugboat from Trieste down into that area where they got hit and bring that ship up to, to uh, where we were in Trieste, the towing. Uh, and of course we had these, I had a picture somewhere of these 13 dead sailors that we had to bring back. Uh, they were, some of them were wounded. We brought it back to Trieste and they went to the hospital in Trieste. The Fox was so badly damaged uh, that they, they said they see going tug Probably the United States after the ship was repaired and the, and the shipyard let us um, brought it back 5,000 miles to Boston 
for permanent repair. Wow. Uh, it was a very sad thing. So, so we had a way to get really by another ship. I was trying to get home. Yeah. That was 1948. Mm. And uh, so Korea was a whole different story. So my father blew his top and I said, Dad, I'm sorry. I didn't tell you uh, I was in the active reserve. So, uh, but that was another pretty good experience. It was more like a, a regular job. Because we I didn't have any sailors, only civil service people. Every department had one officer running the department to represent the Navy. This was a Navy operation. But all the workers were civil service people, servicing the crane, the construction equipment, every type of construction equipment, uh, boxes of electrical equipment. We also stored uh, what we call uh, special materials, like uh, things that might be kind of scarce, like copper and zinc. You know, we had all these ingots, the whole area where we stored all this stuff. And where were you stationed? That, well, I still at the Davis, at Quonset Point is where I lived, and at the Narragansett Bay, Rhode Island. Okay. And the, and the construction center was next door, a place called Davisville. So you managed all the materials that were sh being shipped out yeah. to Korea? Yeah. They shipped everywhere. North Africa, where we had bases. We had, America had bases everywhere. So and we had all the equipment to put them on ships and to send it to uh, Africa, wherever, to build an airfield or and, and a base. And what was uh, sort of your... Uh, daily routine, like the daily routine was a routine. <laughs> yeah, servicing. We when you when I say servicing material, in order to keep this material, a crane, uh, trucks, bulldozers. The routine was to cycle them, test them every few days to make sure that they were kept and ready to go. And then when the ship came in, load up the ship with all this equipment and sent it to a construction crew in North Africa or wherever they were building a base. It was very, very interesting, exciting to be able to do that. But also, you know, kind of an easy routine, uh, like, like a civilian job. And we felt very fortunate to have jobs like that. How did you feel when the Korean War finally ended? I was ready to go home. Yeah. By that time, I had 10 years with the Navy. I was inducted in 43 and left in 53, you know, finally. So, a lot of time, I was ready to go home to work. Yeah. Uh, which, and, you know, we had a very interesting company. We did the Statue of Liberty renovation. Uh, we did the Brooklyn Bridge renovation. Uh, we built the uh, New York City Convention Center, the passenger ship terminal where all the cruise ships went out of in New York. Uh, we built subway cars. We were the most diversified construction construction company of any company in the United States. Mm -hmm. There was nothing we didn't do. Sewage treatment plants, a lot of environmental stuff. I don't know what they do here in Vail. I think they dump everything. But you can't do that in New York. You gotta process the garbage. And we built plants, like on Long Island, there's no room for a dump. Here in Vail, you have a dump. Yeah. Well, everything done. We burned, we built plants that burned the garbage and operated uh, equipment, generators uh, that produced electricity. We used the garbage as a fuel. And so on Long Island, for three million people, all that garbage is burned. 
it ends up running the equipment that produces electricity from from the heat, the smoke. So that was we built two plants all over all over for that. Um, did, would you say that your time in the Second World War uh, helped you during the Korean War? Uh, oh, I was yeah. pretty experienced by that time. Yeah. Yeah. And how did the wars contrast, in your opinion, having lived through both of them? Well, you know, I had it pretty easy. While, while I was at Quasar Point, a lot of the Marines sent R and R back to Quasar from Korea, the wounded, and they were pretty beat up uh, when the American Army. Had and the Marines went all the way up to the Yellow River, which was divided North Korea from South Korea. The Chinese, a million Chinese, came across that river, blowing bugles like maniacs. I think they were coked up, and our Marines really took a beating, and they retreated all the way down to the 38th parallel. And the ones that were wounded, a lot of them were sent back to us uh, to rehab, back to, at the Quonset Point. It was just a rehabilitation center. So we met a lot of those guys. What were the interactions like between you and the Marines? Well, a lot of them were psyched up. Um, after going through the experience, you know, some kid I could place in their head for wounds. Most of the people there have been wounded. They were, the Marines were tough. I mean, we had an officer. We'd be sitting down for lunch. You know, the Navy guys, we were pretty loose. We weren't fighting anybody. But the Marines would suffer so much. We had one Marine kept carrying his 45 automatic around his waist. He was so psyched up, he was wounded his head. And uh, we just kind of took a bit. Hmm. So to see all these wounded guys, it was pretty rough. Yeah, let me see. Uh, how old were you in contrast to your fellow sailors during the World War II? Were you one of the younger guys in 1943? I was pretty young. Yeah, because I graduated. I wasn't even 20 years old when I graduated up my commission. You know, think about that now. You know. So I was already an officer at 20. That's pretty young. Yes. You think about it. So uh, by the time I got out, I was already uh, a senior lieutenant. For me, it was a wonderful experience because I didn't suffer. Most of my duty, were, fortunately, was easy going for me. In fact, it helped me. I learned a lot from the construction battalion that we had. We had, you know, we had. A, I was in charge of a small group of construction guys, uh, electricians, and, and uh, carpenters who were much older. And I, I learned a lot from them. Um. Going back to the Second World War, what was your most memorable uh, experience during the war? Just, uh, well, just the one convoy that we did, where the ships were so continuing, you know, and the guys were killed. You know, there were a lot of accidents too. He was even after the war was over on training. Yeah. Even today, you can read. I'm sure you read the paper. Uh, a plane would crash. It's peacetime. I mean, what, 12 guys died because the plane crashed. So, most of my experiences were interesting and pleasurable. You know, like when we went to Algiers with the carrier Midway, uh, we had scored uh, into Midway, into uh, Algiers, and meeting the local Arabs, 
that already was a good world trip. But for a young person, it was quite fascinating to meet people. And what were your interactions with uh, people from, say, Algiers or the different countries that you visited like? Fabulous. I'll tell you why. I was a supply officer of the ship, responsible for all the, We used to get our meats from the States on the supply ship, but to furnish the crew with fresh provisions, you know, vegetables and things like that, fruit. I was able to, which was fascinating for me, a great experience, I was able to go out to the local business people and sign a contract to furnish us with these fresh positions. As a result of that, I met local businessmen who would invite me to their homes for dinner and meet their daughters. Thank God. Uh, that's for a young guy, that was fascinating. I did that in France and Italy. Wherever we were, I was able to go out and, and mingle and meet local business people. And I also handled the, uh, all the money for the ship. In other words, I got it. We, we didn't allow any American sailor to go ashore with American money because of the black market. We didn't want them to take them only and, and Give, uh, get meet people in the black market and exchange America. We would, I would go to the bank and I, I would bring back local currency. Uh, like in Greece, I took a $10,000 American check to a bank in, in near Athens. I came back with 16 million drachmas, <laughs> Greek dollars. So we, we, we set up a desk on the ship. The men would give us uh, exchange American dollars for the local currency, and they, they were the sure with local currency. We didn't want to get them involved in the black market. Yeah. The black bottle was unbelievable at that time. You could get so much for American money. Uh, so this is all, you know, for a young guy, it was pretty good. exciting stuff. Yeah. Don't forget, I was still only 21, 22. To go through all this is, is just pretty exciting. Yeah. Were there any practical jokes or humorous things that occurred in your service? Practical jokes? That you'd play on your... Oh, yeah. Well, since in the Navy, if you are the only officer, and you were specialty. A supply officer, I was only, you know, an aircraft carrier, you could have five supply officers. On a destroyer, I was the only one. So I didn't have to stay in watches. Meanwhile, when we were at sea, my fellow officers up there on the bridge, pretty boring. Four o'clock in the morning, and standing up there on an open bridge in the Atlantic Ocean. So they thought it was very funny to send a sailor down to wake me up. And, and the sailor would say to me, if he woke me up, this is piss cool. They wanted on the bridge. That was their, they, they were so bored, they didn't know what to do with so. They were je jealous that I didn't have to stand watches. So they'd make me come up to the bridge in the middle of the night. That's a joke. I, they thought it was funny. I didn't think it was so funny. <laughs> But we were a close group, and you only have 13 officers on a ship. Yeah, you could have hundreds on an aircraft carrier, but on a destroyer, you got 13 officers. It got pretty tight, you know. And we were half Naval Reserve and half Naval Academy. You know, six Naval Academy, six Naval Reserve. But it didn't matter, we were the same and the same. What did you miss most? while you were... What did we miss? Yes. You know, on a ship, you have everything. I mean, the only thing you miss is you, there's no liberty. I mean, there's no freedom to go anywhere. It's a little boring, in fact. Just hoping you can get to where you're going. I see. Cross, 
course, the Europe, the Europe would be four or five days at least, six days. How did you keep in contact with your family? Um, there was no contact. No? Now, you know, you wrote letters when you report. There was a whole system. You wrote a letter, went back to a, a Navy post office, uh, finally got to, you know, and you, you get that there was, you'd have something called mail call, where letters would come from the States. And that went for the Army, everybody. How often was mail call? We, we had it, like, uh, once a week. The Army, probably the same thing, maybe longer. But then everybody always waited for letters from home. But she didn't really know what was going on at home. Another question about while well, you were uh, overseas, what was the uh, food like? Was it the food? It was pretty good for the officers. Yeah? On a ship. We always had pretty good food because we, frozen meats came over on a supply ship. And like I say, I, I made contracts locally for fresh provisions. And fruits and vegetables. So, you know, and we had, the officers had a special, what we call the wardrobe on the ship, where the officers ate by themselves. We, had our, we only had 13 officers on the captain. It was a very tight group uh, that we kept in contact after the war. We were half Naval Academy and half regular. Where were you when the war ended? Uh, so the Second World War ended? Uh, I was still in the States. You were in the States? Still in the States, yeah. And what was it like uh, when it was announced there? Oh my God. It was pretty wild. Yes? I mean, I... I you know, people in Times Square were going crazy. Women were busy kissing all the servicemen. I'm sure you saw pictures. Yes. It was a really exciting year. But don't forget, a lot of guys died, a lot of families lost men. You know, it was four years of war. I think we lost a half a million. No, we, yeah, we both, we lost about five, six hundred thousand men. But we lost fifty thousand in Korea. We lost fifty thousand in Vietnam. So you know, it's, uh, and the wounds. You know, with the new, with the new uh, types of bombs and ammunition, guys get ripped apart now. It's uh, not very pleasant. And how did you celebrate personally the end of the war? With family or? Uh, no, I wasn't home yet. So we just went out. Everybody started drinking and celebrating as much as you could. Where were you at the time? Uh, I was, I was uh, in New York. Everybody, everybody celebrated. A lot of drinking, <laughs> a lot of kissing. All, all the guys were grabbing girls, kissing. If you ever saw a scene of Times Square, that's what it was like. I mean, after four years, it was pretty rough. Well, what was uh, reuniting with your family again after, like after coming home? I, I didn't get home till. 48. 48. A long time. And, uh, oh yeah, that was. So I was away a long time. And, uh, so it was just great getting home. Uh, starting your business career. I wasn't home that long. 48, I resigned. 51, I'm back for Korea. Uh, so. If I include my reserve time from 48 to 51, I went from 43 to 53, that's that 10 years. But I was home from 48 to 51. Then after that, my God, I was home for good. And seeing uh, both wars in retrospective, what's kind of your takeaway or you know, when, you, when I think about it, I was very fortunate. I didn't, uh, I would, you know, being on a ship, unless you 
in the middle of a battle. You know, it's not like you're in some foxhole or trench. Uh, thank God I was not the army. I mean, um, I, those guys suffered a lot. When you think about Korea, you see what the, how the Marines got beat up. Um, what was the most the most important piece of equipment that you used? Or is there a piece of equipment that you found especially valuable to to your job? You know, young man, I carried a forty-five. Ten years in the Navy, I've never fired a shot. That's a fortune I was. Even when I went to the bank and carried a forty-five automatic, that was more like a show. You know, I was going to get money, and I in somebody's European places. I, I mean, if I took an American check, I would come back with a suitcase full of money. That's how bad the inflation was there. Like I told you, I went to a bank with a $10,000 check and came back with 16 million Greek dollars. I needed a suitcase and two Marines to protect me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because the kids, the little kids would come up and start ramming at you. They saw you carrying a suitcase. What motivated you throughout both wars? Is there anything that you kind of kept you going? Again, I was very lucky. I mean, I lived, I was in a trench. Yeah. I had a cabin on a ship. It was like, today you would have to pay a lot of money to go to all the places I went to. <laughs> really, in Europe and North Africa, Casablanca, Algiers, the French Riviera, Italy, Greece, Istanbul, Turkey, something you can never forget. Hmm. And, and meeting all these different people. I mean, intermingling with, with local civilians, and business people, and because I was able to go out and sign contracts with them for, for fresh provisions. Just an ex look, I got it, an education. I learned a lot. Yeah. I learned a lot that helped me in my own business when I got home. And I also, it matured me very quickly, you know. What I saw about war when these Marines came back from Korea, they were so psyched out, you know. From, uh, you know, when, when those Chinese came across the Yellow River, uh, those Marines were out of it. They were slaughtered until the army came up. And, uh, the million Chinese, imagine a million Chinese soldiers blow bugles. I mean, they were, I think what the, I think what the Chinese must have done, I think they coked them up. They, were, they came across like maniacs. It's really tough on our guys. Um, are there any very memorable friends or people? Well, we all kept in contact. With after them. World War yeah. I mean, like I say, the 13 officers, it was close. And we all went out together, we partied together. So, you know, different parts of the country, but a few, there were three or four that were from the New York area. So I would see them afterwards. And I got to know their wives. And yeah, we kept in contact. Um, let's see. And, oh, I, this is a question more about your father. Uh, did you, did the First World War affect him, would you say, uh, afterwards? Um, what affected him was his brother getting hit by the Germans with that mustard gas and wearing out his lungs that killed him killed him after he got home because his lungs wore out. He coughed, coughed, coughed. Yeah, he didn't die till about 1932. That's he, that he got, got gas in 1917. So that's a, he could work. And he was a very bright guy too. He would come down to the shop and he was very good with his hands, but he couldn't work. He was coughing and coughing. 
It, it was terrible. I'll tell you a personal story. His son was became a scientist. His son was so affected by seeing that that he actually became a communist in City College in New York, 1938-39. And he didn't wake up to communism until Stalin signed that non-aggression pact with Hitler about Poland. Then he realized that this is not the right thing. But he was so bitter about his father. He turned to communism. He was at City College in New York. But he ended up as a Navy officer afterwards. Yeah. That period. He worked on, uh, he was like a scientist too. He worked on uh, developing new torpedoes. He was a Navy officer. But boy, he was, you know, I see your father waste away because of a war. Oh, yeah, we didn't. You know, there's no TV in that. Uh, it was a different atmosphere. Yeah. We had a lot of communist sympathizers, and especially in New York. And did your father ever tell you any stories of his from the his well, time in France? Most of the stories were miserable in the trenches. You know, was, uh, I mean, when you think about that First World War, how many guys died? in a, maybe a 10 mile area, from trench to trench. The guy would blow a bugle, to get out of the trench, he'd charge through barbed wire to the Germans. Then you'd retreat, leave hundreds of guys dead. Then the Germans would come at you. This is all over in like a three mile area. It was crazy because the generals at that time, like the French generals, they thought it was your duty to die, whatever it took. Now, during the uh, Korean War, when, yeah, during the Korean War, or the Iraq War, like General Schwarzkopf, they already knew, hey, you can't do that. You gotta, life meant something. It's just that this, you did say, Young man, it's your duty to be a soldier. It's your duty to die for whatever we got to do. He wouldn't do anything. He did everything to protect his men. And only do things that made sense. Not the, the First World War, hundreds of millions of guys died in this area about 10 months. Back and forth, back and forth. Insanity. How are you? I'm good. It's good to see you. I haven't seen you in a long time. You still with Sheila? Yeah. Oh, awesome. I'm a, set, a steady guy. I'm only one girl at a time. Uh, well, you know, that, that's real stand-up-ish. I like that. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a different world today. You know? Yes. You know, radio, television, everything has changed everything. Yeah. Once America, once you had TV, and we could watch the Vietnam War on television. You couldn't do things anymore like that. People would blow their tops. And the Vietnam War for people to watch TV and see what really went on, it changed everything. Well, when, when the two atomic bombs were dropped, what? when the atomic bombs were dropped, was there lots of controversy? Did you hear? Uh, that's a good question. Did you watch, it was, did you watch the movie Oppenheimer? Uh, no, not you yet. You should see it. You, want it. you watched it? Oh, it's on TV. So you saw it? You, oh, yeah. What yeah. did you think of it? Fantastic. Because it's an interesting story. A lot of the scientists were Jewish. Einstein was Jewish. If Hitler had done things differently, and all those German Jewish scientists were still in Germany. They would have had the atomic bomb before us. But when they saw the discrimination and the danger, a lot of the German Jewish scientists left, 
came to America. Einstein went went to Roosevelt because he knew the Germans were working on the atomic bomb. He told G uh, Roosevelt that the Germans are working on a nuclear explosion. You know, nobody knew what to make of it at that time, what to call it, but. In effect, they would say they're working on a nuclear bomb. And Roosevelt was smart enough to say, hey, he got a hold of his general. He said, you're, you're in charge of this program. We better get there first. And they assembled all these scientists. Even at Cornell, after the war, we had uh, what they call a chair. You know, college, there's a, certain guys, they, they get what they call a chair position. We had one of the scientists at Cornell, but they assembled all the scientists, Fermi, uh, Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer ran the program. But thank God that Einstein, he got a chair at Princeton, and he told Roosevelt that Roosevelt's smart enough, instead of saying, ah, you're crazy, he said, okay, we got to get to work. Did you ever meet a, one of the scientists from the team? Uh, no, I, I didn't know. We, or oh, we had one, Fermi, was it Fermi? At Cornell, he, he, he became a teacher there. But uh, and my cousin who worked by the Alabama program as an engineer building, they built a whole city where all these guys worked, you know, in, in Oak Ridge in Tennessee and uh, Los Alamos. But just, I met some of those fellows. The program was so big that hundreds of thousands of people were coming. What lessons could people take from your experiences in in the wars? What do you, what did you learn that other people? Would... Well, what I see the value. I think what's happened now is more value of life. Like I say, in the first world war, you, you, what you really saw was. Guys who were generals, they they just thought it was your duty to die, you know. But uh, you just don't think you don't do things like that. You don't send hundreds of thousands of guys back and forth or without a real plan and say, well, so what? That's it. You know, you're a soldier. You gotta die. Uh, we the whole concept of human life, I think, is changed. There's more. Because of TV and everything else, people have learned from watching the Vietnam War on TV. Uh, human life is very important. You know, you don't sacrifice. Everybody's life is important. Uh, things have changed. Very much convinced of that. Using gas, you know, now we've learned to outlaw certain things. You know, after the Germans use that. Most of the gas is a terrible thing. You know, to, people die from the gas. Crazy. Now, at least there's rules of engagement now. Rules, rules of what war is all about. Uh, war crimes. All this is a recent development. What's a war crime? You're not supposed to do certain things. Um, what advice would you give to people from our generation and future generations. Well, let me tell you something. We've got a political situation now that I hope young people will really have it. We need takers. We need educated people who know the difference between right and wrong. I, I'm worried about our political system. You know, I, I know Trump. I, I, I did a job for him. I know him in New York, I know his father, I know his brothers. You have a man like that, he is so dangerous. If he runs for president, let me tell you something, as a young person, you will never have another election because he's going to form a dictatorship. See, he's, he's already said. He's going to get even with this one and get even with that one. He's going to use the Justice Department for revenge. I mean, what kind of crazy talk is that? I mean, you got to fight for democracy. You know, 
You know, you have a lot of you have a lot of people with no education. You can tell them anything. You, you, saw, you saw what happened over there. Some of those white supremacists and you know, proud boys, uh, ignorant people who just listened and went to attack the Capitol. I tell my son and grandson, you know, this country is worth fighting for. Uh, we got a great constitution, you got to believe in it, not try to destroy it. Uh, you don't want a dictatorship here. What I would say to any person, remember you have children, and if you get the wrong kind of guy, he can get you into a war with China, uh, even in the, now in this day and age. You know, not like Trump, he would give a damn. Is there anything else you'd like other generations to know, maybe from looking back on your previous experiences? Be educated about what the hell's going on. I know the difference between, between right and wrong. You want to know the difference between what's right, what's wrong. And we, we got a great constitution, and we should live by the constitution. And the Republican Party right now. What's your opinion on the Ukraine-Russia war right now? Oh gosh, we better we better support uh, Ukraine. Continue supporting them. Doing what we do it now. But now when you read that the Republicans are saying they do not want us to give them any more money, supplies, ammunition, I mean, that's crazy. You can't let Russia win that. I mean, look what he's done to that country. I mean, how many Ukrainians have died already? You just don't evade other countries like that. Uh, and they're, they're really good, the Ukrainian soldiers. I mean, when you think that Russia is 10 times the size of Ukraine, the amount of men that they uh, could put in the field. And Putin doesn't care how many Russians die. He wants to, he wants to do what he wants to do. That's what one man to make decisions like that. That shows you what one man controlling the government can do. I mean, he's a bad guy. Um, is there any stories that you would like to tell me that I might have forgotten to ask or that you would like to add about your service? You know, being in the service uh, with other people, meeting people from different parts of the country, that's an, an education in itself. You know, some of our officers came from the Midwest. You know, we, we became friends. 97 years old. You want to come to my hundredth birthday party? I'd love to. <laughs> I'll be counting on you it. You and Justin. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I'm hoping I'll still be here. <laughs> no, I'm feeling good. Uh, I'm lucky. I'm lucky. Uh, most of my family has... Uh, all my cousins are 97, 98, 100, 101, 102. I'm lucky, I've got good genes. Yeah. So I'd like to be around for my 100th birthday party. I'm sure you'll make it. We had 107, when I was 90, we had 175 guests at the start of LP. Really? Wow. It was a big party. Um, what would you say is uh, one of your proudest moments in, in your life, having lived so long? I'm proud about living as long as I have. And the fact that I'm just, I feel grateful. Green, I have my memory is that God is so good. I come over here and I sing every Saturday night to exercise my brain. I sing with the, with the guitar player here. Really? Every yeah. Saturday night that he plays, I sing with him. If I can remember all the lyrics to all the songs, it means my brain is still okay. Yet the, the worst thing that can happen as you get older is to lose your memory. It's like your life is over. 
And any doctor will tell you the biggest fear of people in their 90s is that they'll lose their memory. And I see it among my friends. Hey, I skied until I was 95. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, I just cleaned out my locker last year. The only reason I, I, I think I could ski if I had to, but you know, at my age, you don't want to fall and break a bone. Because healing is slow. Yes. Yeah, so it, it would be worth it. As much as, I mean, skiing was the biggest joy I ever had was skiing. As, when I left the Korean War, came back in 1953, I got married, and my wife said to me, I want you to learn how to ski. And I said, skiing? What skiing? What is that? Is that a new sport? My wife had already skied. She said, I want you to learn how to ski. So we, she took me to a ski resort in upstate New York. I learned how we both fell in love with it. And we, what, do you, what do you want to study? Uh, probably engineering, mechanical engineering. Mechanical engineering, yeah, that's good. Yeah, I was a civil engineer, but mechanical engineering is also, especially today, with all the new stuff. Oh boy, I can't even keep up with it. I I, I try to get my brain used used to this AI, but uh, I'm having a tough time with that, understanding what's going on with that. But are you using but, AI? Have you used I, it? I I just don't know enough about it. Things that, what's happening now? And look, when I got on my sh first ship, I showed you. And my life has been interesting because we went hundreds of years without much new. When I went on my first ship, and I was the pilot, sir, in charge of money, supplies, everything, they were keeping the books, pen and ink. First thing I got, an adding machine you could buy for $10. Little simple, simple adding machine. We were doing everything with pen and ink. Then, next thing I got was a Marshawn calculator. Simple, excuse me, simple calculator. Tied up, with, uh, tied up next to a British ship in Naples. And the officer on this British ship, uh, great-great-grandson of Captain Cook, he invited me over. They were still doing everything on that ship in 1945, it was. Pen and ink. Now look what's going on. <clears throat> My cousin at MIT, we got back to Boston. I went to visit him when we got back to Europe at MIT, and he was working for the government. He was a professor, but he, the, the mainframe was almost as big as this, half this room. I mean, the mainframe computer that they were working with. Wow. All that information is on your little iPad now. Same thing. And to watch all this today, I can't keep up with all these new developments. I, Every day is like a new invention. This is a great time to be alive. See all that. You, you, coming into a wonderful period. Every day there's new stuff. Things that you can use at home. I see a new thing on TV every day that they come up with. Um, and so, well, that, that's just incredible because I mean you've witnessed so many things in your lifetime. Well, yeah, yeah, that, that that's it. And that's interesting. Yeah, there was no any machine, not nothing. When I first became a, a young teenager. I mean, some of the most uh, important moments in U.S. history, the Great Depression, Second World War, Korean War. That's right. You lived through all I of them. I came all through this. Yeah, 19, stock market crash of 29, I was three years old. And I saw, and after that, I saw how hard my father worked six days a week, sometimes seven days a week, just to bring home enough money to pay the rent. Did you have siblings? Oh, my, my sister. Yes. She just passed away in 1997. 
so. Um, yeah, she was in Florida, but she had four children, so I see them. Uh, but, you know, I, when I was growing up, everybody in the family, cousins, everything, we lived in the same area. We went, on the weekend, we go across town on a trolley inside the New York or something, wherever it was. We'd sit there. And now, families are scattered all over the place. You know, my cousins are all either on the East Coast or the West Coast, Texas. The whole, the world is different. Yeah. And the world is different. I was skiing with a German refugee who, became, who learned how to ski in Europe when he was three years old. And he came here as a refugee and he joined the 10th Pilot Division. And I skied with him in Vermont. He told me about how good the snow was out here. So we came out here in 1964. He started skiing here in 1964. And what was it like skiing with these 10th Mountain Division guys? Well, they were, they were good skiers. You know, we went from the wood ski to the metal ski when that first came out. Yeah. My first skis were, God, I was skiing on 215s. Oh. I saw Stein Erickson when I was, I had a whole big sugar bush for a while on vacation. Stein Erickson was in charge of the ski school. When he did his first flip, he did it on 220 skis. Think about that, 220 inches. Oh. Now guys do the flip, but they're short, a bunch of short skis. I don't know, I was amazing. He was amazing. He was a good guy. He would take all the kids on Saturday afternoon, he'd take all the children out to ski with them. He was a good, good man. And he went to Deer Valley. He was, he was quite a skier. What are some major events that you've witnessed yourself aside from World War II in Korea? Because Justin has told me that you saw Babe Ruth play. Uh, oh, yeah, I did. I saw it in an exhibition game. But I saw Lou Gehrig play. Really? I saw Joe DiMaggio when he first came up. And the Yankees had some of the fantastic teams. 1938, Joe DiMaggio, uh, center field, uh, Selkirk in left field. Joe Gordon on second base, Frankie Grossetti on shortstop, Bill Dickey was a catcher. 1938, I got it. Yeah, that's incredible. Great memory. Mickey Mantle, seeing him come on. That was, he was some ball player. He was amazing. And he did it with bad legs. And he was faster like lightning, he'd run. But, uh, he heard us in the World of the World Series, the Baggio was in the center field, Mickey Mantle was in right field, and the ball was hit to center field. Mickey, this is, you know, a World Series game at Ebbets Field, Brooklyn. And Mickey was coming to catch the ball, and the Maggio was heading in the same direction. And Mantle stopped and caught his leg on a, a sprinkler and tore his leg up. He was the fastest guy, I mean, for guy he, built. he was like lightning, that's a runner. But after that, the guy was such a great ball player. But do you know every day he had to tape his leg? And did it? Yeah, every, every day he spent time taping his leg because he had hurt his leg so badly on that fall. They had to carry him off the field. Did you play lots of baseball growing up in the Me? 30s? Yourself? Yeah, we played the school yard. Yeah. But, uh, what, what did you do uh, to keep yourself entertained aside from... Well, those days we spent a lot of time in the streets. I, I was a street kid in New York. And, you know, those days uh, we all were baseball fans. Because in those days we had the New York Giants and the New York Dodgers, 
the Brooklyn Dodgers all in the same city. Yeah. They didn't move to California, the Giants and the Dodgers, but later. So we just uh, hang out on the street, argue who had the better team. And I was fortunately a Yankee fan. And we would, the Yankees would win everything in those days. <laughs> I think we won four World Series in a row one time. And the Yankees had such great players. That's different now. But the Yankees also had a great farm system. So that the Yankee farm team, the Newark Bears, they won the International League one year by 19 games. Wow. They had guys like Joe Gordon on the team who played the final leagues. Buddy Rose, uh, so Kurt. Would you listen to the games on the radio? Yeah, yes, yeah, before TV. You get so excited. You know, that was major entertainment those days. But you, you know, when you sit, when you could only afford to sit in the bleachers, you learn to appreciate what money is all about. We used to sit in the bleachers in a ball game at Yankee Stadium. I lived very close to Yankee Stadium. It was about two subway stops from the stadium. So sometimes we cut school when Bobby Feller used to pitch against Joe DiMaggio. Bobby Feller was a two or four, 100 miles an hour. Uh, so you'd watch, want to watch him against DiMaggio. And sometimes they'd cut school and look out of the game. But there was no TV. Everything was radio. Yeah. So, yeah, we were, we were street kids, you know. But it was, it was good life. Well, my last question would be, do you have any regrets after that? No. Maybe something you haven't No, done? because I don't have any regrets because they were great, mostly great memories. And, and like I say, I lived the time that I've lived, every day there's something new. Look what's happening now with all the new adventures. Just watching TV. Every day there's somebody in Silicon Valley inventing something new. And to see all this and all these changes. A lot of things that I don't like. I don't like the political situation. I think it's dangerous. That worries me. I'm hoping that people like you will keep level heads and realize you get the wrong people as president. You could be. You could be. You could end up suffering from that. Yeah. It's, oh, we got to get great. We have a wonderful constitution. There are too many people that are re ready to throw the Constitution away and have a dictatorship. Trump would want to be another Hitler.